so I guess we're live now on the webinar also. I love oh. that, yeah. Super. Okay. Well, I, I hope they can hear me. Um, so for those in the room uh, and those that are remote, uh, good after uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is George Lewis. I'm with Arch Mortgage Insurance. Um, I'm here today to talk to you guys a little bit about setting some strategies in the event that um, there is an appraisal gap or the property doesn't come in at the sale price. Uh, we're going to talk about some strategies. Uh, this is being hosted by our uh, folks over at Guaranteed Rate. So I think you all know Alexa and Olivia and AJ and Glenn. No, but nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. no? Okay, so who do we have here? Sorry, I'm Jelly. Well, that's what they're here for. <laughs> I think that'd be good. They're really good. Okay, good. Kind of Okay, well, I mean, we, we figured we'd bring some chashmi for you guys. Mm -hmm. You know, candy is always a good thing. So, who do we have in the room today? Uh, my name is Tiana, and I'm a realtor. Okay, and you've been doing this how long? Three years now. Three years, yeah. okay. Uh, Mark Swift, uh, licensed since uh, 19 years, and uh, brought, I mean, landlord and real Okay, great. Larry Brown, also an investor and realtor, and all this will be eight years from me. Okay. I'm Lisa. Um, I'm on the Center City Listings team. I've been doing this for 10 years. Do you want us to go to? Uh, please, sure. <laughs> I'm Liv. I'm with Guarantee Rate on Jason Grayson and Mike Devon's team. Uh, been at New York for about three years. I'm <laughs> Olson. I also go by AJ. I'm in GR as well with the Broadway Street team. If you know them, been doing it just like three years as well. My name is Len Vanicola, VP at GR, been at GR since 2019. Alyssa, I'm with Guarantee Rate as well. Um, been a little closer for about eight years. Um, I'm Christina Brickley. I just came here from Old Bag Coast out of High Three Long. Nice, welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, a little over eight years now. So, yeah. Okay, super. Since we had a small group, I figured we'd make a little more. Yeah. Keep in mind that if there were any questions during the presentation, um, and I'm going to just shut this for now, it gets a little bit too warm, just let me know, and we will, uh, just so we don't have the back some conversations. Um, I will, we want to keep it very informal for you, so if there's questions that occur along the way, you know, feel free to, to ask, okay? So, um, as you know, it has been a very challenging market, and you can click on our first slide. So this market, I mean, who would have thought, right? This really has been going on for, you know, since, since COVID. And obviously a lot of it's been driven by the reduction in interest rates, but it's also added certainly a conundrum to us because we had low interest rates for so long that so many people have you know had purchased it certainly created an awful lot of um, pressure on sales prices so when there were more it was very affordable a lot of people were trying to buy and what was happening it was driving uh, prices up what has compounded that at this point is the fact that so many loans or people that had purchased are not moving so we have as, as you well know okay i'm not telling you anything no knew if we have a shrunken inventory. And because of that, um, any of those buyers out there, well, you know, there's fewer and fewer properties to look at, but there's more and more people coming on. And AJ and I were just talking about this. You know, if the Fed eventually, hopefully, reduces some rates, we could see even more people coming into the mix. And what's that going to do to inventory? It's going to cause greater pressure on inventory. And what's that going to do to prices? It's going to continue to increase. Okay. And in the appraisal process, typically the number that is the most beneficial to a lender standpoint, because that is the collateral, is the, the property itself and it's that appraisal. Um, but a lot of times the methodology from an appraisal standpoint, as you all know, is um, there's most of the credence is put into the current market. Um, but that market kind of has to catch up. And if the market is moving so fast that all of a sudden property values are, are up, but they haven't caught up to, you know, now all of a sudden you would have that same property 
that just sold for three hundred thousand. Now, with the exact same one a month later, selling for three hundred fifty thousand dollars, you know, it makes it a tough market because of getting that appraisal. And sometimes there can be that difference. And at times, what you'll find is that the um, with that the offers that you're putting in on behalf of your buyers, you know, what's happening there? Are they going over asking price? Yes, typically. So we have that. And the problem from a lender standpoint is that they have to base their underwriting criteria on the lower of the two, either the sales price or the actual appraised value. And what we're finding is the sales price in a lot of cases is much higher than the actual appraised value. And therefore we have that gap. So it's because of this market um, and the strong market that we we're starting to have this appraisal gap. So let's talk a little bit about exactly what is that appraisal gap and that you do. My okay. So the easiest way for us to really kind of describe what um, an appraisal gap is, is kind of talk about a typical area. And what we're going to do is, and I'm sure a lot of you probably can resonate with this example, especially if you're acting on the buyer side. Um, you have many, you know, I, I asked this question, what was the maximum uh, number of homes that you have shown to a potential buyer during the course of the last couple of years. I'll see if you guys can beat my record so far when I present when I presented this. Uh, How many? Twenty. Twenty. Okay. I saw a buyer. Three times a week for two years. <laughs> I don't want to do the math on that. Yeah. It's 150 right, right there in a year. You know, so we're talking, you know, what, what, uh, six, um, 750 at the end of the cap. Did they buy? Yeah, but I was like dual hating. So okay, I, so I I guess. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I, I thought I had a record at 35, but the last one that I did, where lady had actually said, you know, I've taken this, these people to 35 different properties before we finally, you know, we could get something. And I'm sure it's, it's I'm, I'm seeing some head shaking. Yes, more. That's a drop in the bucket. That's a drop if in the I, bucket. If we were to calculate what we got paid hourly to oh, do yeah. that, yeah. it probably a little sure. minimum wage. Yeah. 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 And, and, I don't even know that it was worth it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can certainly, you know, you can you can empathize with this scenario where you know a buyer um, who let's say has not gone in heavy early, and that's typically what happens. They oh well, this is how I was told by my parents of how this works. Um, they want four hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to offer three eighty, and we're going to meet somewhere in the middle. And you try to tell them that no, you're going to instead of three eighty, you're actually going to have to offer four twenty to even be considered. And you're probably going to have to waive, you know, this or that and, and what I mean, in, in order for that. Um, well, a lot of times, um, you know, what happens in that case is, you know, a big difference. So here's a case where we had a 420 uh, purchase price and it was listed at 375, but the property appraises only for $380,000. So the question is, what's our appraisal gap? Uh, what's what's the difference? Okay, uh, how much extra cash you know are they going to have to bring to the table? Is it going to be forty thousand? Uh, is it going to be twenty four fifty eight thousand? Um, let's take a look. Next slide, please. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Eventually. Yeah. After there. Okay. So um, basically, did you? Did I think we did too. Oh, we did one. Did too. Yeah, I was going to say. Hold on. Oh, That's no. another one. Keep going. Get her out of here. There you go. One, one area. Right now. Okay. Okay. So basically, the appraisal gap, as, as you probably know, is the difference be between the two. Here we have a purchase price of 420 with the appraised value coming in at $380,000. Therefore, the appraisal gap is $40,000. Now, what typically happens when, when this occurs is that a lot of people really get nervous, especially the buyers, and, and at times, realtors. 
Uh, and I've seen this in case where they feel that that borrower is going to have to make up the difference. The only way that they're going to be able to purchase the home is they're going to have to, well, what does that mean? Do I have to come up with 40000 you know, additional dollars in order to make this work? Uh, and, and not necessarily. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about strategies uh, and utilizing mortgage insurance within some parameters, okay, um, in order to handle situations like this. Now, one thing. Um, what I want you to walk away with from this presentation is that I do not expect you from your standpoint, okay, to, when we go through the numbers and how it works, to memorize all that. Okay? The most important thing that you can remember in this presentation is getting a general idea of what the situation is and that there is potential solutions. And those solutions are just a phone call away when we pick up the phone and we say, hey, Alyssa, I got a situation. Remember that present gap situation that we had? Um, I think I got one. What can we do? Because you're the experts, okay? Same thing with, with Len, same with AJ and Olivia. So get a basic for what we're talking about today, but realize that when it comes to the nitty gritties and the numbers and working it, you guys handle the real estate side, let them handle the, the finance side, but work in partnership with them. And that's the important thing. And another thing I can't stress enough is the importance of getting guarantee rate and your partners involved in the loan or with a borrower as soon as possible. How many times have you had a situation where you, you have a potential buyer and what they told you as far as their finances and their credit and everything turns out to be a little bit different? Okay, I see a lot of heads nodding. Okay, yeah. So the sooner that you get your lender involved in that deal and we can dig into hey, just, um, that particular deal and that borrower, because what, what most borrowers don't realize is that it all comes out in the wash. So it's better to get them involved early, um, work out the details of the deal, and go from there. Okay, so let's move to the next, the next slide. Uh, the best way, as I said, to describe how we're going to handle a situation like this is actually kind of taking you through the example and take you through the numbers. So here's the scenario I'm going to be working with. Uh, we have a list price of 375, uh, purchase price of 420, uh, funds to close of about 100K, and the borrower originally is going to put 20% down. Okay. Um, we did have to augment when I first started doing this. I think uh, the interest rates, you know, a couple of years ago, at least when they weren't, you know, as, as high as they were, I think we had to augment this presentation maybe about three or four times during the course of the last couple of years. Um, so we had to bump it a little bit, you know, off of this last time. So we're going to use an interest rate of 6.875. So if you would, next slide, please. And... <laughs> Feel like we need the Jeopardy music or something. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here's our examples. First one is going to be we have the purchase price of four hundred twenty thousand dollars, and appraised value actually comes in at four twenty. That's going to be our baseline. Okay. That's utopia. That's unfortunately not reality in today's market. In today's market, we probably more had a scenario in which the purchase price is four twenty. But the appraised value only comes in at four hundred thousand dollars. And let's look at another scenario. Oops. Yes, we'll, we'll be good. Um, the third scenario is which in, in which we have a four hundred twenty purchase, but the appraised value only comes in at three eighty. So we're going to be dealing with a situation in which we have a twenty thousand dollar appraisal gap. And a forty thousand dollar appraisal gap. Now keep in mind that the bar originally had put twenty percent down, and feels that oh my goodness, what do I have to do? How much money am I more am I going to have to bring to the table? Well, it's not necessarily the case. Um, what we can utilize is if you look at the loan to values, and remember the lender has to use the lower of the two. We now have new in the in the base case we had an eighty percent LTV. But now with the property under appraising, we have to use that appraised value. And that borrower originally was going to um, finance 336000 We now have an 84 LTV. So instead of the borrower putting $16,000 out of their pocket 
in order to create the old scenario that they had of 80% because that's what they were comfortable with. All right, we're now able to basically bridge that gap with a higher LTV, but we can utilize mortgage insurance in this case to pay for that. All right, what we're going to be utilizing is a one time premium that would be paid by the borrower that's now going to allow that lender to insure that loan. Okay, because we get above 80, we have that mortgage insurance on it now. So instead of that borrower paying out $16,000 additional to bring it down to 80%, that $16,000, we could only use 1,200 of that to pay for a one-time premium for mortgage insurance. And that's a one-time payment, once and done. So what would you, your borrower probably rather do? Pay the one, you know, the $1,276? Or have to come up with an additional sixteen thousand in order to keep it from a non-MI deal. So now we've been basically, when you think about it, we've been able to bridge that twenty thousand dollar gap with just twelve hundred and seventy-six dollars. Now that single premium of twelve seventy-six is based upon uh, our pricing, my pricing, okay, from from March. Uh, from the mortgage insurance company, and that's based upon the borrower's profile. Now, the borrower's profile that they had lower FICO scores. I used 740 and, and two borrowers. Uh, let's say they had 680. That amount could be, you know, high. Um, if their FICOs were 800, um, it could be lower. So that pricing is not exact. It's based upon the profile of the borrower. We use what's known as risk-based pricing. And risk-based pricing means that we look at probably 12 to 14 different factors about the credit worthiness of that borrower. And we have algorithms that tell us the risk of that borrower and therefore how to price it. So anytime that borrower betters their risk as a borrower, higher FICO, a lower DTI, okay, more money down, chances are their MI premium is going to go down. All right, yes, go ahead. What is it? So on the 80% of, I'll give you the 80, let's say you only put down 10%. Mm -hmm. Is that the best of the Well, it, it, what happens is between, uh, keep in mind that originally an 80% mortgage insurance it is not required. But let's say our base, we started at a 90 LTV, all right, and now all of a sudden we're at a 93% LTV. All right. Yes, the pricing is going to go up, number one, because it's a higher LTV, therefore more risk in that. And not to get too technical, the agencies, Fannie and Freddie, when they purchase that loan, require more coverage of that loan. All right. We go from a, uh, in this case, a 12% coverage all the way up to 25% um, coverage in, the, in that case. Uh, and actually 30% because it's now considered a 90 LTV. Or a 95, excuse me, because we would, in your example now it's a 93. But the numbers can work in situations. It all depends on the numbers. Now we were, yes, Jason. I was just going to say, at every 5% down, you typically see those premiums change. Yeah. All the way down from 97 to 95 to 90, 85, and all the way down. Those are usually the markers that move that number. Yeah, George, we were talking about my buyers have, they're, they're only able to do 3% down. Right. There's no wiggle room. And I have to write into my agreements that there is going to be a rental gap coverage or they're just not going to get covered. Yeah. I mean, we're just doing that. I'm writing that into all my agreements. And, and, and that's the thing. In some cases, this strategy will not work because of the biggest numbers. If we had, if we started with a 97 and it under appraises, now all of a sudden you have 105 LTV loan. Sorry, you just, you know, can't help, can't help you. Yes. But besides the one time payment, yes, you're saying that there would be no additional monthly. Nope, this is a one not like an FHA loan where there's the initial MIP and then the monthlies. There's there's just like guaranteed rate has different products that pays dependent upon the financial needs, wants, and desires of your borrower. All right, it's also PMI or ArchMI has different products. So we have a single, we have a monthly, we have um, our custom monthly buy down program. 
Um, and you could utilize that in that in this scenario. We just find for purposes of, of this of discussion in talking to most of our realtors in regards to this scenario, it makes it easier just to look at it as a one time and it, it's more um, emphatic as far as kind of a wow factor that wow, I can now cover that $20,000 gap with only a $1,200 payment. If we were in a normal market where there were such things as, if anybody remembers, seller concessions, okay, I hear some you know, laughter about that. Yeah, yeah, what, what are those things? Uh, this was a great strategy to utilize in the event of a, when seller concessions were still a little bit available in the marketplace. And I'll give you an example. Um, I had a bank that I was trying to do business with and promote uh, them. And I finally got a call and the lender was telling me, hey, I got a case in which the borrower put 20% down, but the property under appraised. The buyer went back to the seller and said, hey, you got to reduce the price. And the seller said, you know, whatever they say in Philly, you know, uh, when they don't want to do something. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, no, thank you, please. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you can imagine the situation because the, the, the seller would have had to drop the sales price by, I think, about fifteen dollars to $20,000. Now, the, the seller did not want to do that, obviously. And the realtor obviously didn't want to see that because why? Because your commissions are based upon the sales price, right? But the buyer was emphatic about this, and, and he just did not want to pay mortgage insurance. He had it in his head that he was going to put 20% down, the numbers didn't come out, that's it. Well, we went back to the lender and said, hey, pitch this single premium idea. Hi, I don't speak dog, so just so you know. <laughs> oh, you know okay. they're, we're, they're we're in good shape. So in, in that case, what happened is that the lender, the lender presented the idea to the uh, listing agent and said, hey, you don't want to lose this deal. I don't want to lose this deal. As opposed to pitch your seller this idea, as opposed to reducing the sales price by even $10,000, which the buyer wanted $20,000, said, how about you pay, and the number was, I think, $2,000 at the time as a seller concession. And we'll be able to cover that difference in a one-time single premium MI premium. So now everybody won. The seller was able to maintain the exact same sales price. So seller's happy. The listing agent didn't see the value or the sales price go down. So their commission is very happy. All right. Buyer did not want to pay mortgage insurance was emphatic about that, but because of the seller concession, now he didn't and everybody won because of just looking at it from a different venue. So when we hopefully soon get to a more normalized market, keep that in mind, you know, of this option in the event a situation like that, where maybe it does underappraise, but you have some wiggle room with seller concessions. Okay. Tour. Yes. You know, what we'll, we'll always present is both options. We'll say, hey, here it is monthly, or here it is single file, because it usually drives a pretty good question back to the buyers, which is what I always say, hey, it's a bit of a crystal ball question, but how long do you think you're going to be there? Right. And if you're going to be there for two years, then this option makes more sense. If, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm never leaving this house, then maybe a monthly option. Yeah, well, the more times if you have the equity, so then it becomes like, okay, when's your break even? If it costs me $1,800 yeah. and paid it once, but my monthly is $50 a month, right? Okay, you know, a couple months, I'm going to break even. Yeah. So we'll always present these scenarios both ways. We're not going to assume they want that single file. Typically, the break even between those two scenarios has been our monthly MI premium and the single premium is about 48 months. So if that borrowers, if they feel, you know, that they're going to be in that property less or their probability of them refinancing is less than, or, you know, uh, then they go with the monthly. But if they say, hey, this is my, you know, end all home, um, 
you know, I don't see myself for the possibility of refinancing within that 48 months, then they go with a single premium. There is another twist to that, uh, just so we know. So we were able to bridge the, the $40,000 gap with just a premium now $28,89, just for numbers sake. Next slide, please. Yeah. Is this one time payment only to put a 10% down? No, keep in mind that once again, from an MI standpoint, the reason why we have the purchase trust is because that borrower's putting 20 percent down. The property under appraised, now it's an 83, so it becomes, in essence, a insurable loan. All right. The single premium is just an, an option, it's one way of paying for the mortgage insurance. And what if you can do a nine, if you're doing a 10% down, yes, you can do a single, you can do a single, right. you can do a one way, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and always not just that you already know there was something that you didn't need, now you do, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 okay. And, and let me just clarify to you there's so much bad marketing out there on mortgage, there really. And I think you'll appreciate this. There is really no such thing as a no MI loan less than twenty percent down. There's just no such thing. And what I mean by that is, even though you won't see it anywhere, and it's not shown as a fee item on that sheet, where your buyer's raise on, yeah. and we're just taking the money we're making at seven and a quarter instead of seven percent, and we're just paying the premium. So the wire, the no key and all that. Yeah. It's, 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 it's more the only case. Okay, in which really we can say that there are high L above 80 LTV conventional loans with no MI are certain banks at times where they, because of CRA requirements, they have to do certain lending in certain areas and they have to do so much. So the only way to get that as numbers up is to take a hit themselves. And even then, what they do is they originate those loans, they don't have any mortgage insurance on them, but at times they'll go out into the market and see if somebody will help them insure. So and they end up paying out of their own pocket down the road. What is okay. CRA? Pardon? Is that CRA? Not the money. Uh, it, um, um, well, CRA loan, um, community reinvestment. Re re uh, uh, I throw a blind there for a second. Yeah. Um, you mentioned one like the HPAC company. Sure. We can't talk about that. <laughs> I know. They, they used to. You, you want to reach right in there? Can I just say so, the whole thing? That's actually where I learned the business was doing what they call piggyback mortgages. And we, they used to be prevalent. Prevalent. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac got wise that they weren't taking into account the risk that those subordinate liens cause. And I guess like 10 years ago, maybe, um, they started charging. So you heard probably in the news last year too, the LLPAs, the loan level pricing adjustments, like credit scores, different down payments, we move your rate. Uh, it's the same exact thing, you know, where, where those types of things happen there. But um, yeah, so just don't fall for the nonsense. And, and even in those deals, the banks typically have to like find those buyers. Like they're so hard to pay. They, they, they literally have to, you know, because it, it, it's so focused on a particular area or something, but it, they have a tough time. Yeah. And that's why they're offering true, you know, no MI because it's a discounted rate. They, a lot of times they, they offer them at, a, at, a, at either break even or below. And the only reason they're offering a lot of times the, the incentive is for them is that, you know, from an annual basis or, by, or you know, every couple of years, in order for them to keep their charter, um, they have to meet certain standards. And if they are felt that they're not meeting their standards, then they can't expand. So if I'm PNC and I want to acquire this bank in, in Podunk or wherever it is, but my CRA you know, rating is low, then the agencies are not gonna allow them, that deal won't go through. Oh, you weren't doing your job here. Why should we let you expand? When you're not doing what you need to be doing here. And we're getting off topic, but it's really important yeah. the environment. The best thing that's happened for buyers in the last three years is we, the independent mortgage bankers, have gotten a hold of this money. So the banks, I have no problem trashing the banks. Um, they did such a horrible job with it. They can't get, they literally can't give the loans away. Um, and it was so bad for so many years. So we finally, convince Washington, like, hey, 
we're doing, I think, 40% of the mortgage yeah. right now. Companies like Guaranteed Rate, Movement Mortgage, Loan Depot, Cross Country. And they've given us that access now, just like the banks. So we won't do the no MI stuff, but we'll explain it a bit more transparently. But man, that some of this stuff is really dynamic of what we're finally out of it. You know, which I assume you see us pouting with the 3,000 grant, 8,000 grant, you know, all these grants. It really hidden behind all of it is CRP for us. Right. So, just just that the heads up where it yep. kind of comes from. Yep. And, 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 and great questions. And this is exactly what, you know, when I do these presentations and why I love doing them live is, is you have that opportunity to get that feedback and questions. I do want to stay on topic, but super, super conversation. And, and we can certainly go further on that. Okay. We have a situation in which now this borrower has been able to reduce the money out of pocket to just $1,200 as opposed to coming up with that additional money for 28 and covering that $40,000. But let's say they have a situation in which they have a little bit of difficulty coming up with that. What's another way of paying for the mortgage insurance? And that would be the use of actually rolling that single premium cost into the mortgage amount financing. So instead of them paying it up front, we're now financing the cost of that within the mortgage over 30 years. So we went from, uh, I'm sorry, can you go back one slide? I know. <laughs> and you accomplished it, okay? Um, our monthly payment here was 2207, okay? Next slide. What we're gonna do now is we're going to Take that 1276 or 2251, roll it into the 336 and come up with a new loan amount of 337 and 338. Our original monthly payment principal interest was $2,207. Our new payment, we've now financed that 1200. And in essence, we're now, we had a $20,000 gap. And what's it costing me per month? Nine dollars. Oh, I can't even get a sandwich down here for nine dollars. So when you think about it, now your borrower is able to leverage and make that offer of four hundred and twenty thousand dollars on the property, even if they are concerned that the property is going to underappraise, and it only appraises for four hundred thousand dollars, they know because. Guaranteed rate has met with them. They've run the numbers. They've told them you could offer $420,000 on this property, even if it underappraises. And you write the contract stating that we're going to offer 420. And even if the property underappraises and only appraises for $400,000, we're going to be good with this offer. We're going to go forward with this offer because we know that our borrower is happy and is okay with giving up one sandwich a month in order to move into this property all right likewise okay our difference here i like to call it a sandwich and a snap all right so for a nominal difference we've only you know we've gone from 2207 to 2224 okay uh we've been able to leverage forty thousand dollars in that case so by just utilizing a, a single premium, either financing it, paying up front, um, we're able to allow the deal to go through. From your standpoint as realtors, once again, the whole idea here is that, hey, we if we anticipate that there may be a appraisal problem with the property that we're offering on, that we, let's look at a worst case scenario. What happens if, it only appraises for $400,000 or 380. Is my borrower going to be comfortable with the potential scenario? Well, they're going to offer 420 and if it appraises for 400,000, they know it's only going to increase their monthly payment in a nominal fashion. And those are the numbers that you need to be running and having your lender run ahead of time so that you can work together Normally, in order to come up with the best offer, because that may be the difference in winning that bid over somebody else's. That's no, yes, it's, go it's ahead. It's about winning the bid. Like we kind of talked about earlier, 
with the commission structure that just being able to speak to this is a whole other way to prove that hey i am worth three percent this is what i bring to the table that maybe that leads you to buyer if you're competing against another realtor or even on the listing side being able to speak to this and going hey there may be problems with appraisal you know based on the comps but i have solutions for you i mean that's to me just winning the client itself it could be a possibly a big thing if you can get three percent exactly any questions on some of the stuff that we have? Yes. Yeah, um, the last slide at the top, it said there were a couple assumptions. Well, yes. FICO. Yep. Does that mean two bars? Is that supposed to say two? Two bars, yes. So there's I'm one sorry. bar. The yeah, one is typically, issue. yeah, and, 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 and here's the difference because once again, we base our mortgage insurance pricing based upon the borrower's willingness and ability to repay that debt. Mm -hmm. What's the probability of them going into default? You have to keep in mind that um, our company probably has thousands, hundreds of thousands of policies over the years and data on what actually um, what borrowers pay and what borrowers don't pay. You know, what's the default ratio depending upon certain scenarios? Interestingly enough, two borrowers is a much better risk than one borrower. Sure. Okay. Now, the reason being is that, hey, I'm a single guy. I lose my job. There's nobody there to help me. All right. I'm not making that payment. But if I have a partner and that partner, let's say, was unemployed and I've lost my job, well, maybe my partner can find a job for half of what I was making and I can find a job for half of what I was making and we're able to make a mortgage payment. So anytime we increase the probability of, of um, that borrower going into default, whether once again be the, the FICO score, you know, the borrowers determine their own future. Okay. I hate the term destiny. Destiny is you can't control your destiny. Okay. That's the even line. But you can control your, you know, your opportunity in your future. So how important is it to get your lender and to get guaranteed grade, in, you know, involved with your borrower ahead of time to look at somebody's credit? Hey, actually, you know, your, your credit's a little low. That's going to cost you more not only on your mortgage insurance costs, but it's going to cost you more on your mortgage. So we need to start cleaning that up while you're looking for houses so we can move your credit score from a 680 to a 720 or a 740 or beyond and get better pricing. And same things with you know downlines and, and things like that. So it's still possible though with one bar, but the oh, amount would be a lot. More. Yeah, yes, exactly. Does home more than no, 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 small no, 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 it's um, literally a basis points. It's yeah. like yeah. fractions of a percent. Yeah. But there is a difference. Yeah. There is a yeah. Now you move. There are big movers. Okay, FICO score is the is the is the big mover in the cost of mortgage insurance. All right. Uh, also, if you go from a um, it, you know into a new LTV category that Jason had mentioned, you go from a ninety to a ninety five. Well, the the the, the agencies require more insurance because there's more risk. All right, so yes, it can. But you can your you know your posting guarantee rate can run those numbers and give you an idea what that cost would be. Yeah. And I don't know what George's thoughts here are, but one of the things that always helps uh, understand some of the complexities of mortgage insurance is like it's an auto insurance, right? I mean, it's just like that. If you want your if you want your uh, deductible to be five thousand dollars, right? You know, your monthly or your annual cost probably going to be a little bit less. So this is what he was talking about too, where you, you can really kind of customize what kind of premium you want. Um, but just, you know, know that there's a lot of options and what we should be doing, what any lender should be doing is really asking, what do you want? Are you more sensitive about your monthly payment or are you more sensitive about how much cash you're ready to close again? You know, but those questions should be asked. And, yeah. You know, we bet the bar for honesty there too, that they're open with us, we'll help them set up. Exactly. You know? So I noticed that on the four hundred to four twenty, you got yeah. a chart. You're at about six point three eight percent. Six point eight seven five. Oh no, no, six, not, not the rate. How oh. you take twelve seventy six divided by the twelve twenty thousand, you're coming out with six three eight percent. But if you do the uh, forty thousand dollar difference in twenty eight eighty nine, comes out to seventy uh, seven point two two percent. Said so, you guys charging more of a percentage for the higher the gap. 
Is that how it works? I'm not. Yes. I'm done like a single payment. Oh, the same cost. Cost. Yeah, the same cost. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. Same borrower. Okay. Mm -hmm. What we did is we went from an 84 to an 88. Yes, exactly. So it's technically that's a um an 85 LTV loan, and this one is a 90 LTV or above 85. So it's because of that, that coverage yes. difference. So, so the bigger the LTV. The higher the LTV, okay, you think about it from a standpoint that there's less money into the deal, the greater the risk. And that's why, so there's another, you know, additional bulk of that, even though everything else is, is exactly the same, okay? And, and how high the LTV would you go on? Single premiums, depending upon the lenders, a lot of times um, there's differences between the financing side and the single premium, single premium 95, okay? Um, Typically in the past, when you financed the cost, when you rolled it in, most lenders were, the agencies held you to a maximum base LTV of 90, because what was happening is that they were trying to finance at 95, and when you rolled it in, depending upon the characteristics of the loan, it could be a 98, and now it's an unsellable loan. So most lenders though could do a 95 single premium, or up to, let's say, a 95 single premium, as long as it's not financed. So you're saying if you have a 5% I mean, a 5% below whatever the scenario here is, you add an extra 3 or 4% on top, and when you guys can close at 99%, you think? No. No. Okay. okay. Practically at 97. Yeah, you get your shot at what the lenders, you know, maximum yeah. LTVs are. And, and there, I mean, technically, there's community lending products. That you could be in a very narrow box and get done, but that would be... Um, very few far between. So a five percent buyer could five percent down buyer could use this. Sure, uh, sure. Now I, I'll get into the weeds. I don't usually like to present a single file at night. I think it's too. It's, it gets very expensive. So if you look, I did the math, and just remember, you're you're not dividing that premium into the sale price. That premium is derived by the loan amount, right? So it's twelve right. seventy six divided by three thirty six. So your premium on the on the Middle column is 0.38% of the loan amount. Okay. And just to illustrate how much riskier or how much that perception of risk is just on that LTV of 8048, it's 0.86. It almost double over doubles to go from that 8048. So, dollar wise, a pretty good value, still a really good deal to the buyer. But when you talk in terms of risk, the perception of the mortgage insurance company is that your risk just over doubled by going from 84 to 88. That am I saying that right? Yeah, it, it, it's 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 one of the factors that we take into account when we price out. And somebody putting, you know, is is two percent or three percent down or five percent down, there's a greater probability of them defaulting than somebody who saved up, you know, twenty five or twenty five percent and wouldn't need more insurance, obviously, or fifteen percent, let's say, okay, or seventeen percent. Yeah. The chances of them falling, you know, I don't want to lose that equity that I paid you know, dearly out of pocket. So and that's how you explain one more, which, which is the statement, and you're not allowed to answer, Liv, but you're lending people can answer. What is the riskiest loan a lender makes? What is it? What, what percent down is the riskiest loan a lender makes? Percent. That's right. percent down. Why? Because you're not getting insurance on so the lowest you can bid down without getting insurance on the loan. So I always tell people it's like like, like a car. Would you like would you say if you didn't have insurance on your car? I like I would and your friend wants to borrow it. Well, I would ask for a lot of money for him to bid down on my car if I didn't have insurance because if he wrecks it, it's completely gone. I've lost everything. But if I had insurance on my car and it was covered, I'd ask for a smaller deposit because they're going to cover it. For so, me. so you're saying PMI covers the entire loan, not just the not the entire loan, not the entire. Okay, it, 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 not getting too far. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I'd be more than happy yeah. to come into another class for That's you guys. We'll just say right. PMI, but what you're going to reduce the exposure down to is about sixty-seven percent. Okay, yeah. so if I'm a lender. Do I want that loan? Would I lend on somebody? You know, um, it's somebody says, oh, well, I'm putting 20% down. Yeah, but my exposure is 80%. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm on the hook for 80% of the value of that property. It blows smart people. Now, all of a sudden, I get somebody that's at 90, only put 10% down. We give them a but because of the insurance policy that I'm providing as an MI provider, I've just reduced that exposure down to 67%. 
Well, an ADLTD loan, as opposed to really a 67% loan, I'll take the 67% all day long. And that's why you also see in the pricing that pricing at times is better, okay, on an insured loan through the agency than an uninsured loan. And our lenders have certainly figured this out, okay, that they, they look at the pricing and it's like, oh, wait a minute. If I just have this borrower put 1% less down and I make this an 81 LTV loan, they get better pricing. And I'll just, you know, eventually pay off that 1% and then petition to have the MI removed and, you know, all sorts of stuff along well that. But that's a topic for another, another day. Okay. What's another thing? RT. RT? RT. Oh, yeah. RT. That is a good name. Like Archie and Jughead or uh, Archie and. Uh... The from uh, the Riverdale? Yeah. 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 When I first came to Archie, I was like, oh God, I hope I don't make that reference. And this is the first time it's in there. I don't know. No, just Archie. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? <laughs> you can the numbers. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next slide. And I think at this point, for the next one, you brought that. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to your host to talk about some of the strategy and how we're going to be helping you. And it's going to be, uh, we actually covered probably a, a lot of those. Okay, so we can highlight, but I'll let you guys take it from here if, if you see the design. Yeah, go for it. Who wants to go? Who wants to jump in? Next slide. Uh, next. next slide. Anyway, oh, oh. So some of the things that George talked about, we talk to buyers as soon as we get applications. Because it is, um, I'm sure you're aware that your buyers are asking you guys about appraisal gaps. They're asking us just as much about appraisal gaps. Um, so we tell them scenarios all the time, what would happen you know, if appraisals come in low because they are scared about it. They're very scared. Um, so uh, from my experience, it's one of the first things that we even talk about. God forbid what happens if your appraisal comes in low. We talk about it, they're aware so that when the appraisal does happen, they know what will happen if the value comes below. So we talk to them, um, might even before you guys talk to them about it, um, but we're always being super transparent. Where if this happens, then we have a couple other ways that we can have to go. Yeah. I have a question for the agents in the room. What do you guys or what do you what do you guys see? What form are you are you using? Are you gonna say we're gonna accept the gap? Yeah, like, what is what is it? No, the But the way you guys use them for that. I, I put mine at the at the end. Yeah. But, um, I should do an addendum because when the appraisal was going on in the property, they can look at that. Yeah. And you could affect the real I think the appraisals even look. I've had appraisals where, like, I didn't have certain work done in the property, and they, and they valued it anyway. Like, I don't think they look at it. They don't look at the contract. Like, they, the appraisals. No, I didn't think it's the same thing, though, is that the appraisers will oftentimes ask for the agreement. So. Yeah, they all do. Yeah. yeah. No. no. No, yeah. I, I, I know I, I, a buyer agent not send the addendum along with the agreement of sale. I think mean, actually kept it out for a reason. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed it, you know, along the way. Mm -hmm. so it's interesting. Yeah, the, the addendum that I would use would be the general addendum, mm -hmm. not we have there's an appraisal addendum to oh, appraisal oh, contingency oh, addendum. Oh, yeah. I don't think that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's counter access, oh, so dollar bucks. Exactly. Yeah. They don't want to. Like, they want to. Right, right. um, yeah, no, yeah. no. The addendum that I write says yeah. that the appraisal gap will be covered up to X. Yeah. Per, you know. Yeah. Uh, with purchase price, but I don't like yeah. the addendum that we have. It just boxes you in. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, that's like buyer protection more so than yeah seller protection. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you don't put anything, yeah. um, buyers, because our room sale does not, if it, it, it doesn't appraise, a buyer does. And the only way that the lender, the lender can um, deal with it is to reject 
the loan, and the only way to do that is if they actually don't have the money to do it, and that would only be if they are putting in the loan. Like my buyers are putting three percent debt, right? Yeah. Be rejected, right? You know. So. Yeah. 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 Is, is there a form that you typically see that you? Just, just like his room. Yeah. Everybody has a different all the time. Yeah. Some like the addendum, some don't, and they write it in. It's every age is different. But just, just to kind of touch on the appraisal, um every single appraisal order, whether you send it the appraisal or not, the lender is. Mm -hmm. So it's a, just a part of the order. Here's the appraisal order and write it back to the agreement of sale. Um in really extreme cases, I mean, we've done enough where I'll come back and be like, hey, I can't see this. Mm -hmm. Either run into agreement or get out of there. We're gonna, there's a hole in the roof, mm -hmm. uh, you know? And so it's just, in extreme stuff, we will take it back. Like, look, we can't work with this. You're dead on arrival. But not everybody does it. But not everybody does it. Yeah, I mean, correct. Now, the appraiser, though, should have no impact at all, whatever is written in that report. Mm -hmm. Whatever written in that agreement, yeah, nothing. Concessions, yes. Sale price, yes. That is it. That is it. These are the only things they should be looking at. And if you ever get a feel that they are looking at other things, please let us know immediately. Okay, because we all have some captain crusaders that you know try to go over and they think they're going over and above. And in all honesty, they really do think they're helping, and they don't sometimes understand the bigger picture or just what's going on with the buyer or that we know more. So just if you get the sense that they're happening. If it's us, call any one of the GR folks. But even if it's another lender, get up, like ask us. We'll help with other deals too. And we probably know the company, the appraiser, or maybe we know the lender. And we do compete really hard in the field. We do all know each other. So we can usually just call each other. Like, hey, I just got pulled in. And we can just talk it out. Mm -hmm. But don't wait and don't assume it'll just figure itself out. Like, and some of the appraisers are. A little egregious sometimes, but they should not care about any verbiage on that or so be critical. And to kind of cleaning off of that, if you are working with another lender and their only strategy for a low appraisal is bringing more cash to close, kind of stop them right there. Because unless you have a 3% buyer, there's always another solution instead of bringing that lump sum money. So there, there definitely is at least one other option rather than just dying 30 grand on your buyer. You know, Liv, it's a good point, and I don't want to keep belaboring it. I will talk for six hours here if you let me. Um, you, you, you still have a lot of loan officers that think this is a program. I just saw uh, Fairway Lending is a great lender, uh, and I had a loan officer that I actually known for a lot of years that I really respect, and she said to me on the tech, like, "Well, you guys have that program. I, I would like to have that program," and I called my partner. Anybody who put insurance out of this program. So, like, even your loan officers don't know this is a strategy. This is a just being really good at third grade math. This isn't a loan program. This isn't something special. This is just really smart people that know how to keep deals together. This is something new. Yeah, you wish. You've always been able to do it. And you've always been able to do it. It's, it's just that the circumstances have lent itself to be able to use this as a strategy because we, in the past, typically, you know, the markets weren't moving so quickly that the appraisals weren't catching up to the actual values. They worked. Okay, so your values, the appraisal came in at the values for the sales prices. Now, because it's moving so quickly that the, you know, trying to find a comp on something, well, what somebody paid for something three months ago and what's being offered on something now and that's what's causing this gap yeah. and that's why i'm surprised i mean i i started talking and doing these presentations you know right during covid and i was like okay well if we're lucky maybe we'll get six months out of being able to present this to you know realtors and lenders because it eventually is going to catch up well no because as we talked about earlier in the, in the beginning of the presentation we continue to see a lack of inventory, and we can see continue to see a number of people holding on to properties because they're handcuffed at two and three quarters or three percent or whatever. And even though they'd like to move, they can't. And we still continually have new buyers coming into the marketplace and, and first time home buyers. So, and God forbid, we see a drop in rates as we talked about in the very beginning. 
And people say, oh, rates have dropped. Now I'm going to look for a you know, home. Now we just doubled the number of people. What's going to happen to the values? And we're selling a bump even more. So, you know, we could see this conundrum, you know, continue. It's a, it's a good question. Go ahead, AJ. I was just say too, I, I saw a study recently. It was like something like around like 30% of the people right now couldn't afford the all home that they live in. And like, even if rates drop down, it's not even like they don't want to get rid of the two to three percent. They actually cannot afford to like the same lifestyle and afford that same home. It's just not possible. They just cannot afford it. And everything's increasing. You know, car payments are increasing. That hurts the DTI. The insurance increasing at a historic rate as well. I mean, it's just a lot of these people won't be able to get it up. There's not going to be a, an inventory, you know, surplus anytime soon. So you're going to be seeing this. Yeah, and I was just going to give you some context of. It, it used to just be more options to the buyer, you know, in yeah. years past, just, hey, it, it, and we still do this. Hey, I'm putting 20 percent down. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, that might not be the smartest thing, mm -hmm. right? At, it, for $1,300, you want to keep $40,000 in the bank? Yeah. Most people are like, well, wait a second, what are you talking about? So we, we also do that, but I think it is something where it went from that to like, hey, we have some options you don't know about, to, hey, you need to understand this. You're probably going to have to do something. You know, so it's just the market dictating what yeah, we do. Yeah, especially like markets like, I don't know, if it's not always Saudi Arabia, yeah. you know, where in like Marlton, yep. um, yeah, yeah, all that. It's people who pay so much more than it actually is worth it because they want to be in their neighborhood, school district, my daughter, because right now it's so much going to the, um, we have to bring about the things we talked about then. But the thing is, you know, I'm a brand new person from my time back. Uh, what we're offering is mean, I see the cons, right? I see what what the appraisal will see. But at the same time, the appraisal is not saying that what sold two months ago and what is today is so much different. It's more buyers yep. that they want to get into that neighborhood before the summer so they can get their kids to school. Yep. So it's like, I wonder why I don't take that in this way. That would help a lot. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I had that exact question last week. Um, we had an appraisal come in a little bit later, and uh, that was one of the comments from from the agent um, mm -hmm. was, "Hey, wait! They're they're saying this is a stable market. Mm -hmm. Why is it an appreciating market?" Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really get a clear answer. Yeah. And 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 I think what I would tell you is it's CYA. The appraisers covering their butt. Mm -hmm. And I could say you laugh. You know, it's funny, but it, I think at the end of the day, it's all comes down to it. It's like they're not going to push. They're not going to press. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually have had a major issue. So, I, you know, I, I started the business ordering appraisals, and I remember asking my boss at that time, "Like, hey, I'm 20 years old. I'm like, why are we? We're asking for an independent opinion of value. We're giving them the test. We're giving the answers to the test. And why are we giving them the agreement of sale? So, I actually don't like that the appraiser gets it. You should just test it towards the value. You have to be fair. You know, because in my 20 years, I've had, I don't know. And eight thousand mortgages. I've had maybe a hundred coming over about. Yeah. So it's just it's so weird. Yeah, that so that's something I can come up with is they're covering their butts. But you know, you should. I, I like hearing that your phone talks and know what the appraiser is going to see. Yeah. I think that puts you out of the game right away. Yeah, yeah and uh, obviously you communicate that to the buyer and they're willing to. You tell them like, hey, this is best and final. Yep. You have to do a number that you feel comfortable that you have no regrets after. But you know, you give your all. But also, you can't earn the appraisals, and you know that this the numbers are not equal. So, with appraisals, I mean, I'm not very familiar. Is it the same thing that I know? Sure. Like, do they do this? Like, so they access the same exact system. Yeah, okay. They're the only other licensed real estate professionals, I believe, that are allowed in the MLS. They won't let us in, mm -hmm. they won't let any of us out. Licensed appraisers, licensed real estate agents. So, so I, I just want to yeah. wrap my head around this because I didn't know this actually. So the appraiser does get the agreement of sale. Every single agreement. Yeah. Okay. Every single one. So then the, the strategy as a listing agent that I have considered was to to in the MLS to jack that price up, mm -hmm. show the, what the value of the you know the purchase price like mm -hmm. what it, it actually is, which I didn't know that, but mm -hmm. now I know. They see all your price changes, they see all your revisions, yeah. they see all your statuses. Okay. Yeah. They shouldn't care, but they see it. Yeah. Yeah. But listen, this is why too, and we've gone to great lengths to have really good appraisers on that path. So we are not allowed to select appraisal for any what do we do? But we do know that the 
four to six professionals is going to, we know for an average of like 20 years, and they're usually pretty good. And that's why you want to work with what works. Yeah. Like, I've worked with the bank for many they don't know yeah. you know yeah. they don't listen to you yeah. so you have to go with it and then it's just like that's where we are yeah. you know but like i do think it just it's a bit stressful because i feel like i would look at the cons like for example the deal that i'm selling right now and i'll look at the, the property that is the closest to my home and i still but that property from three it was 325 and sold 375 in five days yeah. so you see that demand is there yeah. so I'm thinking, would the appraisal go back and see that and say that, hey, this sold faster, so this probably also should be worth it, at least, yeah. you know? Like, would they have you? They don't receive the appraisal. Yes. 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 Anything else that you can use to shoot in the Yeah, you can go to all of your appraisals. So. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to. Okay, two things I'll throw out. First off, sending comps, if you can get the email address, whatever standard. I think that's standard. But usually they contact the buying, the listing email yeah. address, but not the buying email That's right. If you're trying to do it and buy, you don't know unless you're being told when it's happening. Yeah, so some of the agents that you would know, say, and you guys say, hey, you know. we'll, we'll usually run the American Yeah, some of the agents we work with strictly say, give a fee increase. Like, yeah. Yeah. like they'll, like, we just had one where the buyer yeah. agent did our work for us. Hey, I, I already talked on this thing, I'm going to meet an appraiser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So give them all that. And the appraiser called the listing agent anyway. Yeah. They already directed back to buyer's agent. But it's like, hey, tell us that stuff. Yeah. You know, we'll, we can make that happen. We don't care. And this is what we tell all our people. You can say anything you want them. You're fair game. And we will usually tell you what we think should be said. And then you can say whatever you want. Um, so just know that you're not handcuffed yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, but the listing agent cannot yeah. do that. The listing agent cannot do that. They can talk about whatever they want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. any realtor can. Just don't get an attitude. Yeah, yeah. 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 very nice. Yeah. 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 The yeah. Yeah. They won't get upset. If you have an attitude, too, I'll have the champagne. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, you can go to all of the appraisals. You can talk with the listing side. You can talk to the appraisal to figure that you know whatever. And I will say too, from the couple of really professional, long tenure appraisers, they appreciate that. And and it's not yeah, that, that they're leaving and you're doing their job, mm -hmm. but they want that conversation. They know that you know more than them about. They're not realtors. They're not selling real estate. So they'll be happy, the good ones should be happy to have an engaged agent. Like, thank you. Okay, good. I didn't know that. We had one where brick versus stucco, million dollar homes in media, and we have a huge brick house, and every comp was stucco. I think you all know enough about the stigma of stucco, even in the city. Like, that's a big deal. And we had to get a whole other appraisal because we didn't agree that that was an indicative value because that buyer looking at a big old brick house and big old stucco house, which one they're going to buy? They're probably going to buy the quick. It's, it's, it's materially different. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of conversations we brought up front because we kind of knew that and handled a lot swifter. Okay. Versus the other slime about proactive versus yeah. react. Right. Is just get ahead of it, you know, and, and, and jump in. But yeah, high communication with the appraisers. We implore you to communicate with them. Mm -hmm. We implore you to provide them with comps. Mm -hmm. And they do appreciate it. One of the appraisers these days are sick of feeling like the bad guy, yeah, yeah. the being don't buy. So yeah. you can yeah. if you still you're willing to work with them and talk to them, like that goes a long way. Yeah, that's very helpful. I mean, I think it's. I love appraisal waiver. Me too. You guys are like, <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, that's a good one. Oh, we all we all yeah. jump on the desk and dance at those, and it just takes the whole thing out of the equation. What's your typical situation? So, a good question. It's full. Uh, there is none. Is what the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were going to tell you. So, but, but to answer your question, uh, for since 2010, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have required lenders to upload raw data to every single appraisal that's been done in America since 2010. So, think about that. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have every single piece of data on every single residential home sold uh, in that time. They have used that data uh, to predict markets. Mm -hmm. And they can stick an address in, and at a certain sale price, they feel like, hey, we see those comps. We just finance for those houses ourselves, and we're good at that value. Mm -hmm. So it really should only be 
looking at the raw data of other comparable homes and it says is that more of a situation where somebody's doing like 50 percent down it has no relevance on down payment is what we've been told i would tell you that's probably not entirely the case of course a waiver on a much less riskier loan like 30 40 50 percent down i imagine the robots inside that black box are like over like this but it should be just raw data based on appraisal reports and your buyers have to be okay with that it's what a lot of what doesn't get talked about is you know it is the buyer's choice mm -hmm. and we have actually had buyers like that's great i don't care i'm mm -hmm. willing to pay the 600 bucks because i think i'm overpaying for it right i think i want to know all the details mm -hmm. yeah that's I mean, few and far between but they do we have, we have to present them We're like hey this is great news 600 bucks this is awesome this probably means your value is there this is directly from the lender this isn't a human this is actually the decision maker saying you're good you're probably good but yeah, yeah, yeah. Really I mean, because we think about just getting a deal close, right? Like us, you guys, everyone, but like for the buyer, those appraisals really are meant for their protection, you know? I mean, the lenders too, obviously, but it is there for them. And I recently had someone had appraisal waiver and that they want to be appraisal waiver. Yes. Okay, yeah, we would, and we'll, you know, we, we do it. But it is. Uh, especially the first time home buyers have been pretty right? Yeah. It's like, Especially in the market for selling, like, selling is another one. Like, and certainly, yeah. yeah. Well, what I'm always like is, I think when they open that report, when we send them that appraisal, it does put you back in your chair. You know, it's a 17, 25 page document. It is really intense. Mm -hmm. And and it, and I like it because, hey, look, you paid $600 for it. So, damn well, better be something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. and, when, and when you open it, it's like, oh, wow, like, holy cow. Because it's not a home inspection. It's not the agreement sale. It's not anything like they've seen yet before. And it's all just data about the home that they think they love or want to buy. And um, people that take the time to review and come back, and they're usually like, wow, like, this is really serious. Like now I get a little bit more of a glimpse of like, you know, you're about to give me $400,000. It's pretty serious. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like it for just that reality. Like this is really important. And thank you for being transparent. Now I know as much as you do about the house and what buy. And that changed in 2010. We never had to tell people. So one of the great changes with that Dodd Frank that changed our whole world is it changed the ownership of the appraisal from the lender to the buyer, which was probably the greatest thing the government's ever done in my humble opinion of mortgage. So it's good forced transparency. Oh, is that is that because then we kind of like as lenders they don't think of their own? So I think yes, well, worse than that and more shady than that is your appraisal would come in low in 2008 mm -hmm. i didn't even have to tell you i would just put on that mortgage okay. insurance to tell you we had to change fees now we didn't do this I yeah <laughs> but shady lenders would just do this change it hey have a new form of sign you got to bring another 1500 to closing hey, i was this mortgage insurance thing don't worry about it and they have no idea they just bought a house fifty thousand yeah. dollars so that's yeah. what's yeah. happening yeah. rampant so that's also why it was a very good rule to change that. So now we don't have a choice. We have, I think it's three business days from the moment we get that appraisal, we legally uh, or compliantly have to send out to the buyers. And then they have to send it back saying, hey, we reviewed it. So it's good. These are good things. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of all we got. Our contact info is up there. So if you have any questions, let us know, reach out to us, and we can absolutely have them. So. Yeah, 